And it's such a, a pleasure to be here again uh, for a second night. Um, uh, the, again, my disclosures, I have no financial disclosures. And as I emphasized last time, there's a risk to uh, history based on biography. And so I want to uh, echo the words of uh, Sir William Osler, who we'll learn about today. Um, what more delightful in literature than biography, and yet how uncertain and treacherous is the account which any man can give of another's life. Um, so certainly history of, uh, based on biography is incomplete and can be very biased. So I, again, encourage those of you who have an interest in medical history uh, to seek out the History of Medicine Department's wonderful online program. As you recall, last time we, we uh, took a, a step back in time to 1893. And at that time, there were at least 100 medical schools in the United States that would accept anyone uh, willing to pay. Uh, less than 20% required a high school uh, diploma. In 1870, you could, uh, at Harvard, fail four of the nine courses and still get a degree. And there was only one uh, school of medicine in the United States that required a college degree. And that, of course, was uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, last time we talked about the remarkable uh, philanthropy of Mary Elizabeth Garrett and how she stood up to uh, Gilman and others and insisted on the high standards of uh, admissions to Johns Hopkins, requiring an undergraduate degree, being fluent in multiple languages, um, and uh, standing up to someone who denied her uh, an education. Um, and we also talked about John Shaw Billings, who literally was the architect uh, for the School of Medicine. And so now, uh, today, we'll talk about uh, the first two people we'll talk about will be uh, uh, individuals who uh, inhabited the, the School of Medicine and embodied uh, Mary Elizabeth Garrett and John Shaw Billings' dreams and, and really got the word out about it. Uh, so these are going to be William Henry Welsh and Sir William Osler. Uh, so going back to the Sargent uh, painting, uh, the two we're going to talk about today are William Henry Welsh, shown here, and uh, Sir William Osler. And next uh, week, we'll talk about William Halstead. So let's start with Welsh. And I, I love this uh, picture of him and, and his eyes. Um, uh, William Henry Welsh was born in 1850 in Norfolk, Connecticut. His mother died when he was only uh, six months old. And so he was raised by his grandmother. And here you can see a picture on their porch. Uh, this is uh, Welsh standing here. Here's his grandmother and here's his father. His father was a, a country physician uh, using uh, old uh, uh, remedies to treat patients, not based on, on scientific medicine. But I think you can get a sense of his upbringing from this photograph. At the age of 16, he entered at Yale uh, uh, undergraduate and he uh, excelled. He was clearly a, a brilliant student. And this is from one of his classmates. Well, uh, the Victorian mark, uh, but was very near it. And yet there was about him no suggestion of the dig, the bet noir of the average under underclassman. His acquisition of knowledge was effortless. He seemed to absorb it. It was as easy as breathing. Uh, so here he is. and. Uh, uh, on graduation, and you uh, uh, note the, the skull and bones emblem. He was admitted to this uh, uh, club based on his academic uh, successes. Um, thinking back at, at Yale, one should uh, remember what Yale was like at the time. Uh, science hardly existed in the curriculum. And uh, I, I love this story from Welsh. When later asked to speak on Yale in medicine, Welsh wrote, it's about the most barren theme which I have ever tackled. The relationship's so slight that I shall have to beat around the bush and talk on side issues. If only they'd asked me to talk on the relation of Yale to Calvinism or football, there would have been something to say. Uh, after graduation, Welsh wanted to teach at Yale. He wanted to teach Greek. He was not interested in medicine, but there were no positions for him. Uh, so he taught uh, for a year at a private school in Norwich, Connecticut. Uh, relatively young students. And uh, I love this quotation from Simon Flexner's biography. Welsh's future looked so black and empty that he listened to his father's voice as it urged him to follow the family tradition and go into medicine. So the reason many people go into medicine, I guess. Uh, he apprenticed with his father for a year and then went to the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which is uh, now, of course, Columbia in New York. He entered in 1872 
And at that time, there were no admissions requirements. It was really a business enterprise uh, with a, a healthy respect for uh, uh, Grisham's law of proprietary medical schools. Don't raise the standards above one's worst rival schools because the students will take their fees elsewhere. Uh, there was a single exam at the end for graduation and uh, Welsh wrote to his sister, the easiest examination I've ever entered since leaving boarding school. He graduated in 1875 and uh, went to Bellevue uh, where he served as an intern. And, and really at this time, he'd reached the pinnacle of American uh, pathology, American medicine. He did what many uh, young uh, trainees did when they graduate from American medical school, they went to Europe. Uh, and so he traveled in 1876. Uh, in America, Welsh had a reputation as knowing far more uh, than his colleagues. In Europe, he was refused acceptance into two labs because he knew too little. Uh, and he, most importantly, he absorbed, he loved the European model, which we talked about last time, of science applied to medicine. And uh, as I mentioned last time, when in Europe, while, while in Europe, he uh, met uh, John Shaw Billings and Auerbach's Keller in Leipzig uh, under the painting of uh, Faust making his deal with the devil. And that's where uh, Billings and Welsh uh, shared their vision of science applied to medicine and bringing that to the United States. After uh, time in Europe, he came back to Bellevue and uh, recognized the sad state of American medicine. Uh, he, as he wrote, I sometimes rather feel blue when I look ahead and see that I'm not going to be able to realize my aspirations in life. There is no opportunity in this country, and it seems improbable that there ever will be. The condition of medical education here is simply horrible. Um, but uh, Johns Hopkins opens, and in the spring of 1884, uh, Gilman, the president of the university, officially offered Welsh a faculty position as the chief of pathology at Hopkins. And at that time, pathology, as it is today, was the, 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 the pinnacle of science and medicine. And so this really was the, the top job in the School of Medicine. And as Welsh described it, I can develop my field in Baltimore unhampered by traditions. The surroundings are scholarly and academic, and such great things are expected of the medical faculty at the Johns Hopkins in the way of achievement and reform. So he was now in his element, what he had dreamed for. And here you can see him uh, at the time uh, he was invited and came to Hopkins. So uh, uh, looking at the future uh, 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 boldly. Um, so how was he? What was he like when he came to Hopkins? Uh, as a teacher, he was known to be a great teacher, um, but didn't give priority to uh, textbooks. Instead, he focused on uh, the original sources and on uh, doing science for oneself. Uh, uh, quote, laboratories took the place of the lecture traditional in American medical schools. The hospital patient was nature's laboratory and the experiments the place of, of precepts. Um, he was a great teacher, and, and I love this from one of his students, Winternitz, who described him. Uh, one incident that happened during the year stands out in my memory, how Popsy, and he was aff affectionately called Popsy, was quiz quizzing the class and he rubbed his vest pocket against the table and a handful of sulfur matches ignited. He didn't stop talking, but just took the matches out of his pocket, put them on the table while we watched in amazement. I think we all dream of having teachers uh, like that, uh, absent-minded professors who love to teach. Um, but uh, he was not only a teacher, he, was, he also uh, promulgated the scientific method. And uh, here's a picture of the pathology building where his lab was. Um, and it was described a general spirit of research, a fine esprit, esprit de corps. Uh, clinicians and laboratory men were living together on the circumstances of delightful intimacy. He had an ability to hear someone describe an experiment and immediately define the critical points and key experiments uh, that had to be done. He inspired unconsciously simply by being himself, simply by being popsy. Uh, he set a tone in his lab, which determined the tone for the whole institution and that was a general spirit of research. Um, importantly, he combined his teaching and his research, he invited the students uh, into the lab so they could investigate on their own. As a result, many independent investigators were created um, and his prestige was so great that his students then were offered the best positions. And indeed, many of his trainees went on to become directors of departments and deans at other institutions. 
And so the, the message that Welsh had, had created was now uh, spread uh, throughout America. And uh, Max Bradel, the famous artist, uh, 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 drew this. Um, and to be honest, this sends a, a shiver up my spine. I find it kind of creepy, kind of like a clown uh, in costume or something. Uh, but these are uh, some of his trainees, many who've gone on to fame at the time. Um, he was also a leader uh, of medicine, so a teacher, a scientist, and a leader. Um, indeed, he was the first faculty member recruited to the School of Medicine, the first director of the Department of Pathology. Um, I'm the ninth director. He was the first. Um, he was the first dean of the School of Medicine, the first dean of the School of Public Health here at Johns Hopkins, and the first director of the Institute for History of Medicine. So uh, quite a number of accomplishments here at Johns Hopkins. Um, but it said that the uh, first class uh, leaders uh, recruit first class uh, people, and that was certainly true of uh, William Welsh. Um, and an example of that is Franklin Mall, the great anatomist who we'll learn about in the third lecture, um, who was offered uh, very significant sums of money to go elsewhere, and then telegraphed, shall cast my lot with Hopkins. I consider you, Welsh, the greatest attraction. You make the opportunities. Uh, so he was able to attract the best and the brightest. When he wasn't done leading at Hopkins, he led American medicine. Um, and to give you a few examples of his positions, any one of which would be a remarkable achievement. He was president of the National Academy of Sciences, president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, president of the American Medical Association, president of the Association for American Physicians, and he founded the Journal of Experimental Medicine. Uh, so it had all of the major leadership positions in the country. Um, and how did he do this? Well, William Osler, again, we'll learn about Osler in the second half of this talk, uh, kept a diary. Uh, and uh, this is what he wrote in his diary uh, about um, uh, Welsh. And I think it explains why he was such a great, great leader. By, our, by far the ablest man of the group was the professor of pathology, William H. Welsh. A more useful man never lived. His time, his books, his purse were at the command of all. He was the most even balanced individual I've ever met. Never perturbed, always in good humor, and always ready to look on the bright side of things. I never heard him pass a harsh judgment on anyone. He had strong convictions and never was afraid of expressing his opinion. One always knew where he stood on any debatable question, one which he generally said the last word. So an impactful uh, leader. Uh, not only was a leader in America, he went beyond America and indeed was an international leader. And this is his uh, 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 suitcase uh, that uh, still exists in the Chesney Medical Archives. And I love the way he put stickers uh, on it for different places he traveled. Um, uh, and to give one example of his international leadership, the Rockefeller Foundation wanted to bring Amer American or Western style medicine to China. And so they selected uh, Welsh as one of the leaders of this to design Peking Union Medical College in, in Beijing. And uh, uh, this was modeled after Johns Hopkins. And so here you can see uh, Welsh on the porch at the opening, uh, standing next to uh, uh, Rockefeller. Um, so the Hopkins model not only uh, permeated across the United States, but internationally uh, to China. And remember this archway because a hundred years later, I had the privilege on the 100th anniversary of the opening of Peking Union Medical College of, of, of being present. And it was just such a treat to be there where Welsh had stood a hundred years before. Um, but he, he did more, and again, now he guided philanthropy uh, to scientific medicine. And this is one way he was able to uh, get the word out even further. Um, and uh, Flexner, when, when asked, uh, if you had a million dollars uh, to be used for medical education, what would you do with it? Uh, I should give it to Dr. Welsh. Um, and many people, in fact, did. And he wisely invested their money uh, to make a difference. Uh, for example, he was the uh, president of the board of scientific directors of the Rockefeller Institute and helped found, it was his vision to found Rockefeller University in New York. Uh, he was chairman of the executive committee of the Carnegie Institute and guided the Carnegie uh, philanthropy to support scientific medicine. And so he directed the flow of money from the two leading philanthropic organizations in the country. And this, is, this also helped make possible 
the scientific revolution in America uh, that he envisioned. Um, and here you can see Welsh uh, on the roof of, uh, of Hopkins with the Rockefeller. Um, uh, he uh, also was a, a leader, uh, uh, as I mentioned, in World War I, um, and in fact was appointed a major in the medical section of the Reserve Corps. So this is 1917. Remember, he was born in 1850, so he would have been, what, 67 years old, and they, they uh, uh, made him a major. Uh, remember him as he looks here, because this is obviously a po posed picture. Uh, here he is uh, in reality, and I think in France. Um, and I, I love the way they described him in his military uniform. He replied to salutes by lightly lifting his hand vaguely in the direction of his hat and wiggling his fingers to these firm, crisp uh, salutes. But he played a major, a significant role uh, in this. Um, and indeed, when the influenza pandemic of 1918 uh, 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 started to break out in the military uh, barracks, uh, the, one of the first people they called was Welsh because he was the leader of American medicine. And uh, Cole describes, the only time I saw Dr. Welsh really worried and dis disturbed was in the autumn of 1918 at Camp Devens near Boston. And so they called him up because this is where the influenza was striking. There was a continuous line of men coming in from the various barracks to the hospital, most of them cyanotic and coughing. Owing to the rush and great numbers of bodies, the deceased bodies coming into the morgue, they were placed on the floor. We had to step amongst them. Uh, so what did Welsh do? Uh, right away when he left Camp Devons, I think it gives you an idea how we should respond today uh, to COVID-19. He calls uh, his uh, friend and colleague at the Brigham because this was up in Boston, uh, Bert Wolbach, and asks him to autopsy the patients, to study the pathology. Because unlike now where we know it's caused by a virus, they didn't know what was causing this. Uh, he then asked Oswald Avery, at the Rockefeller Institute. Remember, he helped found the Rockefeller Institute uh, to research the disease, uh, which Avery did, and, and uh, the, the group of scientists helping to identify that it was a virus. And he urged uh, Charles Richard, uh, the acting Surgeon General, to make immediate provision in every camp. So to take the public health measures, wear masks, don't bring uh, new people in, uh, uh, isolate. Uh, all the things we should be doing today Welsh in these three phone calls identified and set into motion in the flight, fight against the influenza pandemic of 1918. Uh, Welsh himself contracts the disease, uh, probably from Camp Devons and is seriously ill, um, but nonetheless, the generation of scientists he trained, armed with the scientific approach that he promulgated, led the fight against influenza in 1918. Um, so he, uh, they give you a sense of his prominence. He was, on his 80th birthday, uh, was on the cover of Time magazine, uh, and indeed was the face of American medicine and had uh, built American medicine in, in, uh, on the model of Hopkins. So Hopkins was a model of its kind. What was he like as a person? Um, he was a great procrastinator, and I love this story. Um, uh, volume one of the Johns Hopkins Hospital Reports was supposed to be uh, on pathology, and volume two was supposed to be on medicine. Uh, Osler, again, who we'll talk about next, uh, started volume two after Welsh. Volume two was published in 1890. Uh, Welsh published volume one seven years later in 1897. I'm sure it caused great confusion to have the volumes out of order. He was generous, uh, and uh, uh, to quote one of his medical students, uh, as I started to leave the dining room, Dr. Welsh said, Hume, I know you are going to be hard pressed financially. I've cut out your signature from two or three of your letters to me and have pasted them onto bank deposit card at the Merchantile Trust Company. I've deposited $300, which at that time was a fair good bit of money, there in your name, and they will honor your signature. So without being asked, he reached out and supported uh, those who needed support. Um, was there an evil side uh, to Welsh? And um, to set the stage for this story, um, you can see Welsh on the right uh, on the balcony with Harvey Cushing. And Harvey Cushing uh, was one of the fathers of neurosurgery, uh, trained at Hopkins, and was very close to Osler, who we'll talk about next. But this now, Welsh is at the age of 82, and he's traveling in Europe uh, with uh, Harvey Cushing, the neurosurgeon. And uh, Cushing describes about 6.30 a.m. there was a knock on my door. 
And hopping up, I opened it to find Popsy standing there in his pajamas. And Popsy said, there's trouble in store for us. Please come to my room immediately. There's been a murder there. After I turned in, I was aroused by someone opening the French window. I leapt from the bed and grappled with him and finally hurled him over the balcony onto the street, not without serious loss of blood. We must get out of Paris before the police learn of this. So Cushing rushes over to Welsh's room, uh, opens the balcony and sees this uh, a mass of uh, uh, red uh, uh, towels and newspapers. And it had turned out that Welsh had spilled a bottle of red ink in the middle of the night and was playing a prank on, on uh, Cushing. So he had a great sense of humor as well. His private life, he lived alone and rented rooms or a house on St. Paul Street. He was an Orioles fan, of course. He spent most of his time at clubs, particularly the University Club and the Maryland Club. Um, and these clubs uh, became the center of his life. Uh, he was often there till two or three in the morning. Um, and uh, he said, I never go home until after the bandits have gone to bed. He loved puzzles and he and his colleagues and Halstead was one of his colleagues would share puzzles. And I'll share one of his puzzles with you and give you a moment to see, uh, can you figure it out? So this is one he sent to his sister. And he said, insert a vowel in the proper place. And it's the same vowel, use only one vowel. Uh, uh, places to obtain a sentence indicating knowledge gained at one of our oldest universities. Uh, so it's Orthodox Oxford dons no good old port from Longwood, Logwood. So he, he loved puzzles. And if you go to the archives, you can see many puzzles he, he developed and worked on. Um, he, uh, outside of that, uh, loved to go to Atlantic City. Uh, as he said, doubtless this is a vulgar place, but I am contented. And I love him in his swimming trunks here with a cigar in his mouth. Uh, he said, there's a terrifying, miraculous, blood-curdling affair called the Flip-Flop Railroad. After being pulled by a trolley to the top, you go down from a height of 70 feet. Kind of a a modern-day roller coaster, he apparently liked. Um, and here you can see Welsh, I don't know who the women are, uh, taken uh, uh, in New Jersey, clearly enjoying himself. Um, but uh, to look more deeply into his private life, he never married. Uh, in addition to visiting Atlantic City, he uh, often visited Turkish bathhouses here in Baltimore. And the students had a rhyme that they sang about him. No one knows where Popsy eats. No one knows where Popsy sleeps. No one knows whom Popsy keeps but Popsy. Um, and in going through his papers at the archives, uh, found uh, photographs like this of, of, of young men um, and on the back, you can see he wrote, admired the original um, and uh, greatly admired the original. And um, it, I think, is, is quite clear looking back that uh, Welsh was gay. And the, really the, the sad thing, he was never able to express himself, never ex able to open up about his sexuality. And this had such a profound and I think sad impact on him. Uh, uh, Simon Flexner described a lifelong habit of not confiding in anyone, irrespective of who that person was or what, they, what he knew. Always he had been surrounded with people, and during most of his life he had moved on a public stage towards public ends, but he had kept the inner core of his being inviolate. Um, and I, you know, I hope today that this uh, won't, same thing doesn't happen, but uh, uh, clearly it did with Lynch. He. Uh, was admitted to the hospital in 1933, uh, uh, probably for prostate cancer, and died on April 30th at 5.30 p.m. in 1934. So he spent over a year in the hospital. Things were a little bit different there. He obviously set up a shop in the hospital. And again, uh, look, at, look at his eyes, because I think they tell us something. Um, so when I think of, of Welsh, I think medicine through the lens of science and unselfish generosity. Uh, and I think his college classmate uh, describes him beautifully and in, in, in ending my description of Welsh, I'll end with this. I feel that I ought to express my great indebtedness for the kindness which we always manifested towards me, the pure example you set me, but more than uh, all for the patience with which you endured my many annoying practices and habits. Billy, I feel now more deeply than ever the truth of what I've often said to others, if not to you that I was utterly unworthy of such a chum as yourself. I often pitied you to think that you were compelled to room with me, your inferior in ability, dignity, 
and every good and noble quality. And what a wonderful thing. I don't think my college uh, classmates or friend would write that about me. Um, so now let's talk about uh, Sir William Osler. So Welsh was the first chairman of pathology. Osler, uh, the first chairman of medicine, probably the greatest physician North America has ever produced. And he really defined what it means to be a physician. He's a Canadian. He was born uh, outside of uh, Toronto, outside of Muddy York. Um, and he's uh, all the way here. He was uh, one of the last of many kids on the far left. Uh, a prankster, uh, one of his pranks at the, uh, the, the school, he locked a flock of geese into the classroom. And you can imagine the stir that uh, caused. Another one, he created a kind of a smoke bomb. Uh, and uh, as he, when coming home, told his sister, Chetty, I've got the sack. And there was even, I think, an attempt to put him in jail as a young kid. He was so, so mischievous, but his uncle got him out of it. He started a medical school at the University of Toronto and then moved to McGill. And he graduates from McGill in 1872. Uh, he then is appointed the uh, pathologist to the Montreal Hospital. Um, and uh, again, just a generous individual, volunteers on the smallpox ward, if you can imagine that and think I got a, a mild case of smallpox. He was a, a physician seeing patients, but he also performed over a thousand autopsies. So he and his students could uh, listen to heart sounds, uh, do the physical exam, and then see the heart, hold the heart in their, in their hands, and understand the pathology underlying the clinical findings. So his students compared their clinical diagnoses with the subsequent findings at autopsy. Um, and here you can see him uh, doing an op performing an autopsy. That's him. And I love it, uh, doing it in his, his fine clothes with his uh, 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 top hat on. Um, and here, an, another uh, picture uh, uh, where you can see not wearing gloves. And in fact, he uh, acquired a case of tuberculosis of his hands, where he had cuts and the tuberculosis germs lived in his hands. Um, he, from McGill, he went to the University of Pennsylvania and then was recruited to Johns Hopkins in 1889. And you can see him here with his uh, young trainees. Um, at the time, he wanted to write his textbook, and so he asked one of the young residents, can I borrow your desk in your room, uh, which he did, and you can see he quickly took over the room of this uh, poor resident, but, and he researched and wrote an incredible uh, textbook of medicine, the kind of the standard, and it was published in 1892, The Principles and Practice of Medicine. Um, uh, but if it was just that, he wouldn't be known today. He really was an extraordinary philosopher, uh, a philosopher on what it means to be a, a physician, and I think a philosopher on, on how we should lead our lives. And so in the next, I'm going to read uh, some of his philosophy. I apologize, some of it, it's, it's rather long, but I wanted to give you a sense of his, the breadth of his philosophy. And it's my hope that some of it rings true to you uh, today, and maybe we can carry some of his philosophy forward. Uh, bedside teaching. Uh, he wrote, I'm firmly convinced that the best book in medicine is the book of nature, as written large on the bodies of man. You remember the answer of the immortal Hunter, and of course he's talking about Hunter, the great uh, surgeon from England, when it asked what books the students should read in anatomy, he opened the door of the dissecting room and pointed to the tables. And so Oser was the great uh, bedside uh, teacher and brought that to the United States. It had, it had been in, in Europe before, but he's really the one who got the message out here in the United States. And before long, uh, the students, many, many students would gather around and, and watch him. And there are stories of how he would arrive precisely at 9 a.m. at the dome as a couple of his chief residents would be waiting and they'd take him arm in arm up to the wards where crowds would soon gather uh, to watch him at the bedside. And indeed, Osler designed no epitaph other than uh, the statement that here lies the man who admitted students to the wards. Um, he's probably most famous for uh, equanimity. Um, and he, he felt that there were two qualities that were needed to be an effective physician. Uh, the first is one you're born with. It's a, either you have it or you don't. And that's imperturbability, that coolness and presence of mind under all circumstances, calmness and, um, amid the storm, clearness of judgment in moments of grave peril, immobility, impassiveness. And I can tell you a story. I was at one point doing heart research, heart transplant research, and I was in the operating rooms 
and uh, 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 Dr. Wrights uh, was performing a heart transplant, uh, which is obviously something that high pressure. And there was someone in the room who dropped a, a sealed container into a vat of liquid nitrogen and exploded. And Dr. Wrights was there calmly suturing. The explosion went on. He didn't miss a beat. And after about five seconds, looked up and said, is everyone OK? Um, so Bruce Wrights has imperturbability. Um, but there's a, a, a equivalent uh, or a similar uh, quality called equin which he called equanimity, which is the mental equivalent to the bodily endowment of imperturbability. And he believed that we can all uh, cultivate equanimity. So if you don't have imperturbability, you can cultivate equanimity. Uh, and he said, cultivate such a measure of equanimity as would enable me to bear success with humility, the affection of my friends without pride, and to be ready when the day of sorrow and grief come. So equanimitas. And indeed, the scarves and ties uh, that our medicine residents wear today have the emblem of, that says equanimitas on it. So his philosophy lives on today. <clears throat> he wrote about the secret of success. I propose to tell you the secret of life as I have seen the game played and as I have tried to play it myself. Though as a little one, the master word looms large in meaning. It is the open sesame to every portal, the great equalizer in the world, the true philosopher's stone, which transmutes all the bare metal of humanity into gold. The stupid man among you it will make bright, the bright man brilliant, the brilliant student steady. It is directly responsible for all advances in medicine during the past centuries. And the master word is work. A little one, as I have said, but fraught with momentous consequences. And uh, it clearly uh, uh, holds true today. Um, one I mentioned last time, and one I love, consume your own smoke. Learn to consume your own smoke. The atmosphere of life is darkened by the murmurings and whimperings of men and women over the non-essentials, the trifles that are inevitably incident to the hurly-burly of the day's routine. Things cannot always go your way. Learn to accept in silence the minor aggravations. Cultivate the gift of taciturnity and consume your own smoke with an extra draught of hard work so that those about you may not be annoyed with the dust and soot of your complaints. What a beautiful statement. Um, Daytight compartments, and this is something I think he got from uh, Thomas Carlyle. Um, this is one I, I tell you, I, I find impossible uh, to, to follow, but uh, let me share it with you. The load of uh, tomorrow added uh, to that of yesterday, carried today, makes the strongest falter. Shut off the future as tightly as the past. Who can tell what a day may bring forth? The future is today. There is no tomorrow. The life of the present of today, lived earnestly, intently, without a forward-looking thought, is the only insurance for the future. Let the limit of your horizon be a 24-hour cycle. And again, I, I can't do this one. I, I, uh, constantly I'm worrying about mistakes I've made in the past and I'm anxious uh, about the future, but uh, a beautiful sentiment for those who can do it. <clears throat> one, a beautiful one, lifelong learning. The great fundamental principle laid down by Plato that education is a lifelong process in which the student can only make a beginning. To cover the vast field of medicine in four years is an impossible task. We can only instill principles, put the student on the right path, give him methods, teach him how to study, and early to discern between the essentials and the non-essentials. And I think this is true whatever field you're in. Uh, it's a lifelong learning process. Um, and in fact, he recommended that uh, uh, we should all have a small bedside library. So start at once with a bedside library and spend the last half hour of the day in communion with the saints of humanity. And uh, the, here he lists the 10 books that we should all have by our bedside. I, I have my iPhone on. I'm looking at a YouTube video about how to play chess or something. Uh, what a wonderful a way to end the day, uh, as suggested by Osler. Uh, respect for uh, our fellow physicians and our fellow man. Uh, many physicians whose daily work is a daily round of beneficence will say hard things and think hard thoughts of a colleague. No sin will so easily beset you as uncharitableness towards your brother practitioner. So strong is the personal element in the practice of medicine, and so many are the wagging tongues in every parish that evil speaking, lying, and slandering find a shining mark in the lapses and mistakes which are inevitable. Never, under any circumstances, listen to a tale told to the detriment of a brother practitioner. 
or, or a fellow human being. And indeed, uh, love of our fellow man was uh, central uh, to uh, Osler. Uh, as he said, nothing will sustain you more potently than the power to recognize in your humdrum routine, as perhaps it may be thought, the true poetry of life, the poetry of the commonplace, of the ordinary man, of the plain to toil-worn woman with their loves and their joys, their sorrows and their griefs. Uh, so love your fellow man and, and beautifully sin. Um, and indeed, Osa was known for loving children in particular, and Michael Bliss in his biography uh, wrote that nothing struck me more forcibly about the beauty of Osler's personality than the magic he could generate with little children. It shines in scores of wonderfully whimsical, loving notes and in dozens of anecdotes and, and memoirs. He was a man who would have stood out and indeed did stand out in any crowd, except that he had a habit of disappearing from the crowds to find some children uh, to play. I love that one. Um, so uh, in his life, uh, after he finished his textbook, he married a Lady Revere, the great granddaughter of Paul Revere, uh, as shown here. And interestingly, when he was in uh, Philadelphia at Penn, uh, uh, Osler, Lady Revere, and this gentleman in the back of uh, the famous Eakins painting of Gross, who is Gross's son, uh, were friends. And in fact, Lady Revere's first husband was Gross. Uh, Gross died. And uh, after his death, uh, uh, Osler married the widow Gross. In our talk on Halstead, which is the third uh, of these lectures, we'll come back uh, to uh, this Eakins painting of Dr. Gross and contrast that to what was going on at Hopkins. So he marries uh, Lady Revere, the great granddaughter of Paul Revere. And uh, they had uh, two children. One died shortly after birth. Uh, but their son Revere uh, is shown here. Um, I think the stress at Hopkins got too great because uh, people were coming from around, er everyone with any problem was coming to Hopkins uh, to be treated by Osler, um, uh, the poor and the wealthy, the prominent and the not so prominent. And I think the, the stress uh, became overwhelming. And so he decided to move uh, to England, to Oxford, uh, where, uh, since they didn't have a hospital, he could be uh, more at, uh, uh, at peace and uh, uh, focus more on his writing. And here you can see them in their yard. Um, but uh, there was a tragic side to this decision. Um, uh, their son Revere uh, volunteered uh, in the First World War and uh, his battalion uh, took uh, part in the third uh, battle of Ypres. Um, on the afternoon of August uh, 29th, 1917, uh, Revere was hit by a German uh, artillery barrage and was badly uh, injured. Um, he was evacuated uh, to the casualty clearing station. And remember that uh, picture I showed of uh, Welsh on the balcony with Harvey Cushing? Um, and I mentioned Harvey Cushing uh, was a, a, a resident here at Hopkins and in surgery, and in fact trained for many years under Halstead, and was very close to William Osler. In fact, uh, Osler gave Harvey Cushing the keys to his house uh, when he lived here in Baltimore. He called them all, one of the latch keyers. Uh, Osler had a great library and his favorite uh, trainees, he gave keys to his house so they could come to his library and enjoy his library. So Harvey Cushing uh, was extremely close to Osler and uh, uh, Harvey uh, Cushing was the one there who tried to save uh, the son of his uh, mentor and friend. Uh, sadly, he was not able to, and uh, Harvey Cushing wrote, we saw him buried in the early morning, a soggy Flanders field beside a little oak, an overcast windy autumnal day, the long rows of simple wooden crosses, the new ditches half full of water. Uh, what a tragic end to Osler's son, Revere. Um, and indeed, I think Osler uh, knew that uh, happiness did not come to everyone, that some people would uh, face uh, terrible sadness. And in Equanimitas uh, spoke about this. Uh, and he said, it is sad to think that for some of you, there is in store disappointment, perhaps failure. 
You cannot hope, of course, to escape. Stand up bravely, even against the worst, for in persistency lies victory. There is a struggle with defeat, which some of you will have to bear. Some people will simply be defeated. And it will be well for you in that day to have cultivated a cheerful equanimity. And indeed, uh, after Revere's uh, sad death, tragic death, um, uh, Osler outwardly uh, uh, was positive. I think people uh, who knew him know recognize that there was a fundamental sadness and that Osler never recovered uh, from Revere's death. And uh, in fact, uh, he wrote before his own death, the fates do not allow the good fortune that followed me to go with me to the grave. Call no man happy till he dies. Uh, so when I think of Osler, I think of patient-focused teaching, a bedside teaching, if you will, and the philosophy of being a physician and the philosophy of of being a good human being. Um, but uh, let me conclude by, again, emphasizing this dramatic transformation uh, of American medicine. Uh, Welsh and Osler brought the changes in vision by Garrett and Billings to life. Um, they personified it. As leaders and through their students, they then promulgated the message of change uh, throughout America and throughout the world. As a result, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine uh, radically transformed American medicine, forever focusing its teaching, research, and practice uh, through the filter of science. Uh, and Osler, I think, uh, uh, described it beautifully. To have lived through a revolution, to have seen a new birth of science, a new dispensation of health, reorganized medical schools, remodeled hospitals, a new outlook for humanity is not given to every generation. And I wanted to uh, share uh, Osler's with you, words with you, and these are my wishes for you, uh, channeling Osler. Um, there should be for each of you a busy, useful, and happy life. More you cannot expect, a greater blessing the world cannot bestow. Busy you will certainly be, as the demand is great. Useful your lives must be, as you will care for those who cannot care for themselves. Happiness lies in the absorption in some vocation which satisfy, satisfies the soul, that we are here to add what we can to, not to get what we can from life. And so uh, lead a useful life. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Again, I wanted to point out the Chesney Medical Archives and Nancy McCall's team there is fantastic. For those who want to go to the original historical stuff, um, and uh, uh, A Life in Medicine by Michael Bliss is a great story of Osler. And if you want to try and live your life like Osler, uh, uh, Charlie Bryan uh, down in South Carolina uh, wrote a book, Osler, Inspirations from a Great Physician, and gives guidance about how you can try and uh, live uh, like Osler, except for the daytight compartments, which is too hard. Um, so thank you uh, very much. Again, next week, we'll do Sacrifices in the Name of Science. We'll talk about William Stewart Halstead. Uh, probably the greatest uh, surgeon uh, America's produced uh, and the innovation he brought around uh, about, but also the terrible personal struggle uh, that he suffered with. And Jesse Lazier, uh, a pathologist here at Hopkins, who gave his life uh, to fight a, a, another virus, yellow fever. Um, so I hope you'll find those uh, interesting.